Good deal in the back? All right. Hi, my name is Austin Witt, senior software engineer on the DevTools team at HomeAway.com. Uh, my team builds an excellent set of tools and best practices that our development teams can select from when creating the deployment pipelines that they will use to get their software products out to the world. Uh, we are currently working on using CloudBees Jenkins Enterprise to add a build platform as a service to our selection of products that teams can choose from. And one of the things that we've had to contend with while building that product out for our developers is caching. Uh, so today I'm gonna to talk about persistent caching in ephemeral environments or how to not download the world on every single build. There's obviously a big push to put applications inside Docker containers because there's lots of benefits. There's a smaller push to build applications inside Docker containers for largely those same benefits. In CloudBees Jenkins Enterprise, which hereafter I'll call CJE for some syllable saving, the primary means of getting a Jenkins slave in which to run a job is to spin up a Docker container with a Jenkins slave inside of it, do the job, and then throw away that Docker container. Uh, this is excellent because you get a fresh environment, but that means you have to contend with your build environments being ephemeral. Uh, as a developer, you might be used to one time downloading the world every time you get to a new project. Uh, build tools tend to use on-disk caches for their dependencies, and the first time you build a new project, and only the first time, you'll probably have to sit through something like that. That's a snippet of a Maven build, downloading a bunch of jars, but the story's the same whether you're building a node module or a Ruby gem, you sit and it downloads everything that it needs the first time. And whether that takes dozens of seconds or dozens of minutes, it's really only gonna be one time for you. Uh, you tend to use your same laptop and those files will be there waiting for you next time you go to build a project. And if you build related projects, that second project might already have a bunch of its stuff on your disk from the first time project you were working on. But CI systems are not necessarily this way. Uh, CI systems like Jenkins. Subsequent builds in CI might not run on the same hardware. You might not have all those dependencies already on your disk and you would have to download them again. Uh, CI systems might sanitize the working directory, the whole disk or some subset of it between, between jobs or they might run jobs in brand new environments each time, as is the case in Jenkins CJE with a brand new Docker container for every job. So a naive job in Jenkins CJE and generally inside a container is gonna end up downloading the world every single time on every build. This was in fact the largest and first complaint as we rolled our CJE uh, Jenkins environment out to internal testers at HomeAway was that their builds were taking far too long in Jenkins compared to anywhere else because they had to download the whole of their dependencies on every single build. So what do we do? Uh, well, we did solve it. I just wanna throw this out here. You can see uh, I've, this is a uh, audit job that I've got set up in our Jenkins that just runs uh, and proves that the caching that we've, solution that we come up, come up with is still working. On the left, you've got two Docker builds. On the right, you've got two builds that don't use Docker at all. And that's just showing that uh, they do exactly the same thing except in the pipeline script for the uncached and slow columns, I have gone and added stuff to deliberately undo and or block all the caching work we've done so, you can compare, so we can compare how much benefit we are, get, we, ha, we are still gaining each day from the caching work. So you can see the cached and fast are significantly faster than the uncached and slow. Uh, these just build a web app, and the Docker ones build the web app inside a Docker container, and then put the web app in another container for distribution. And the legacy ones just build the web app as is. So what do we do? Well, the low hanging fruit was sharing build dependencies into the Jenkins slave container. Uh, if you just Bind, if you set up the in CJE, if you set up your Jenkins slave uh, container such that any directory that's going to contain build dependencies is bind mounted to the host machine, then the first time a build runs, it will download the world and those will end up being mirrored back out to your host machine. And the next time a build comes along and a Jenkins slave starts on that host, that vault bind mount will be there and the build tools will see those dependencies already on disk. Uh, and so at HomeAway, we run our CJE on AWS which means the CJE tool automatically creates a Mesos uh, Docker task running cluster for us. And one of the executors in there is the real machine on which tasks run. And this is on SSH into one of those machines in a directory I have chosen arbitrarily called temp Jenkins shared cache. I have put a bunch of directories that might traditionally contain build dependencies. You see there's a .m2 repository for Maven artifacts, a .npm repository for your node modules, .iv2 cache for Scala and so on and so forth. And if you set up your Jenkins slave container such that this is bind mounted into the right place, uh, then things will work. So here again, at the above the yellow line, we are still on the Mesos executor. I docker ps to see if any Jenkins jobs are running. Fortunately, some were at the time. So I docker exec into one of them, and now we're below the yellow line. I go to where I would expect these on disk uh, dependency caches to be uh, in the home directory and ls, and you'll see there's a .m2, a .iv2, etc., uh, and they are 
all symlink to temp Jenkins shared cache. So as long as I ensure that this Jenkins container, uh, Jenkins slave container starts up with temp Jenkins shared cache in the container, bind mounted to temp Jenkins shared cache on the host, every build will see an ever growing cache of dependencies on disk and most builds will never have to download the whole world. Why is there a symlink and not just a direct bind mount? Uh, because Docker complicates things. We are providing a build platform as a service to the entire dev org uh, to run whatever jobs they need to get their jobs done and they will want to run Docker as part of their builds. Depending on how we make Docker available, there are more caching battles to fight. There's two ways of providing Docker. There's dude, Docker on the outer Docker, and din, Docker in Docker. I'm gonna talk about the caching battles we have to fight with each one of those. Uh, so dude, Docker on outer Docker. Blog posts on the internet say you ought to bind mount the Docker socket from your host into your container and only ever have one Docker daemon and then things will be great. And if you look on the left here, uh, I don't know how visible that is, uh, but I, that is an audit job I have set up on our CJE cluster that just prints a bunch of useful information about all the various types of slave containers we have. And this one is showing for dude, we have a bunch of Docker images there. Those are, that, that is the local Docker registry of the host machine in AWS. Every Jenkins dude slave that starts up will have all these images already downloaded, uh, ready to go, and jobs that use them will not have to wait. But if you look on the right, there's a red box and a problem. I don't, I don't think that's, I don't think that's very, visible, uh, very visible from a distance, but what that's showing is that you can bind mount, jobs that run inside this dude container can Docker run and bind mount the working directory into their containers that those jobs start, but not the home directory. Uh, in fact, and that is the problem with dude, is that bind mounts don't work. Uh, at all unless you specially instrument a directory at Jenkins container, Jenkins slave container start time to be able to be used as the source of a bind mount when somebody, when some job comes along that tries to docker run with a bind mount. And I don't have time in this lightning talk to read you all the things on here, but they just don't work unless you specially uh, instrument them and there are some things you just can't do. So if I am a team with a job that needs to docker run with a bind mount, this solution will not work for me. So, and since my team is providing tooling to all of our developers, what do we do? We have to offer DIND as well. If you go with full Docker in Docker, then all your bind mounts, bind mounts will always work. But you create a second problem. If you look here, this is another screenshot of that same audit job, this time printing out uh, information about the DIN container, one that I've specially set up to not have a cache. And that red box at the bottom shows there's effectively no Docker images present. Before we had a plethora of useful images left over from previous builds and ever growing cache, and now we have nothing. And since you've gone to full DIN because you, you're, you want to run jobs that Docker run with a bind amount, we know you're gonna wanna run a Docker container, so we know you're gonna have to wait in Docker pull, and now you're waiting again on, the dependency, on a dependency to download, this time that dependency is a Docker image, whether it's from or a tool that you need. So what do we do? You can't have an ever-growing cache. Uh, again, I don't have time to lightning talk to, go, to uh, dive into this, but no matter how you try to pull the host machine's uh, pre-downloaded Docker registry into a container, you're going to create a circular file system dependency, you will run yourself out of disk space. Or if you're in a cloud environment that will auto-scale, you will run yourself out of money. You have to come up with some other solution. And that is to preload instead of having a cache. So if we knew what Docker images our developers were likely to use, we could bundle them up and make them available in those DIN containers so that they would probably not have to download something they were gonna use. So that would look like this. You would run a Docker image uh, ahead of time in full DIN, and we would Docker pull all the images that we think our developers are gonna need. And that's what's happening here. You can see the tail of a Docker pull at the top. It lists all the ones. It builds a tarball. Uh, that tarball is the relevant parts of the varlib Docker of this DIN container that we started. And then we ship that tarball out to all of our real machines. In the case of our CJE on AWS, that is out to all of our Mesos executors. And then that tarball sits on disk waiting. Then we configure our DIN Jenkins slaves such that when they start, before starting a Docker daemon and before handing control off to Jenkins, they start with that tarball bind mounted in and before they do anything else, they extract that tarball to varlib Docker inside the dinned container. And then when the Docker daemon comes online, it will see a populated varlib Docker with a bunch of images waiting for it, despite being a brand new Docker daemon that has never done a single Docker operation, let alone a pull in its life. And uh, that works. Uh, now our developers can make an informed decision about which type of Jenkins node to select based on how they're going to use Docker uh, or if they're going to use it at all. This is the flowchart we provided them to guide them in that decision. And again, uh, I, I know time, I'm pressed for time on Lightning Talks, so I don't have time to guide you through it, but it's a flowchart. Uh, there were some considerations to take, uh, to, there were several considerations to uh, rolling out this preload. Among them, is it going to be too big? And the answer was no, it's actually smaller than a uncompressed varlib Docker, of course. 
uh, and it's certainly smaller than the file size taken up by the sh uh, dependency caches on disk. How long does it take to build? Uh, well, if I popped, if, you're, if you were paying attention a few slides back when we were distributing it, you saw it was about 12 minutes to build uh, the, the uh, base set of useful images. And if we do that once nightly and refresh what was preloaded, 12 minutes a day, that's nothing. Uh, how long does it take to download? It takes about five minutes to pull that back out of a central artifact repository or into our executors, but that's once a night to refresh. Uh, and the big thing was actually unzipping that three gig tarball, which is how big it currently is uh, for us with the images we've selected, at runtime before every single Jenkins build. Uh, and it turns out originally that was borderline too long to actually too long. We were using just plain old gzip with one thread. It took 60 seconds in a perfect world and up to, you can see on the blacked out chart there, up to uh, 100, 200 seconds when there was contention for, other th uh, for disk resources. Uh, turns out the answer is a thing called pbzip2, which is a multi-thread implementation of bzip2, and that will take up as many CPU threads as it can find, and in a perfect world, you will then unzip that three gig tarball in 16 seconds, and in an imperfect world, eh, in still 100 seconds, but it works much better. Uh, and I'm pretty sure I'm close to time. This, these are the, uh, what I thought were the relevant tech versions of the stuff we're using. Uh, major shout out to pbzip2, that was actually a huge component in actually getting this to work. And if someone in the back can tell me how much time I have left, I will be happy to take questions. Awesome. Any questions? All right. Well, thank you all for listening to me. <laughs>